it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 137 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we roasting today? Today is a delicious Honduran coffee with notes of baker's chocolate and cardamom. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Now you too can drink the same coffee that we drink. Where can they go? Bantamroasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. Okay, so how was your 4th of July? You know, like it usually <laughs> is. <laughs> I don't know why you would ask me that question. I stood in the field and cursed loudly every time there was an explosion and the sheep freaked out. Yeah. That's why I asked. I mean, part of me just wants to buy a bunch of fireworks myself and just shoot them back. <laughs> every time the animals would be just as upset. They would. It's why I don't do it. But think about that. <laughs> just like I'll have fireworks coming over there. You want to put a crack firecracker up? I'll, I'll see you five firecrackers. Here you go. I like your thinking. Why don't you come over and spin? <laughs> Fourth of July with you next year, <laughs> or you just sit there with like the little historic drum, like dun 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 dun. dun. <laughs> Damn! Why didn't you give me these ideas last week? <laughs> yeah. Oh man! Ooh, borrow a snare oh, drum man. from my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> like go right up to their house, <laughs> or a bagpipe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, that'll freak out the sheep too. Yeah. Other than that, it was great. How was yours? It was good. It was quiet. Just, you know, hanging out with our friends, the neighbors, and playing some yard games and having some drinks. That sounds great. It was just a a nice day. So now that 4th of July is done, it's always that turn of the summer. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Before you get to the 4th, it's like you have the excitement of the beginning of the summer. It's it's new. It's fresh. We have a whole summer ahead of us. You get to the 4th, feels like you hit that turn. Well, you you have kids, so that's probably part of it because I don't even think about that anymore. I think the kids are part of it, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're like, oh, counting down the time. Then well, you're like, by oh. the time we get through the beginning of July, I'm just like, get us to cool our nights, please. Yes, I hate hot nights. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just the one thing like I could do without just the hot nights, so that the chickens can sleep with a nice little breeze out there without fans and everything else would be great. Well, we're going to be talking about that a little more in the episode. Yes, we are. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it. Head over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It's another really easy and quick way you can help us grow and you never miss an episode. You can tell a couple of chicken-loving friends about the podcast. Like 500. (laughs) You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can head over to our Etsy shop. Our new tank tops are up. Oh, yeah. They're fantastic pink with the new watercolor logo. Everybody's going to need one of these. They're great. You can become a patron of the show. Head over to patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website and or our show notes. Use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. 
in the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Time for the breed spotlight, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I still wanted to do the little snare drum. I see that. It's that time of the year. It's July. It makes you feel patriotic. It's all about fife and drum. Fife and drum, Always. baby. Oh, I know what I'm going to do another one for. Oh, it's going to be great. Okay, so this week's breed spotlight is... The dorking. The dorking. And don't talk about the dorking to somebody that's not really paying attention because they'll think you're calling them a dork. It's yeah. happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It has. I'm going to start off by saying this is a bird that will be in my flock someday. I really, really like the dorking. Yes. You have always said that this bird is going to be a member of your flock. Mm -hmm. The dorking is a truly ancient breed of chicken, probably one of the oldest in existence. And a breed that has been used to breed so many other chickens, a foundation breed across yeah. the board. Yep. It's in a lot of your favorite chickens. Especially the salmon feverals. Mm-hmm. Now, the Dorking was most certainly present in ancient Rome. They were likely brought across Europe to Britain along with the Romans. Those Romans. Those Romans, the chicken superhighway. The Dorking are a dual-purpose breed with lots of wonderful traits, and I mean lots. Oh, yeah. They're a great bird. It's very possible, it's probable, that the Dorkings would have been present in colonial America. Yes, definitely. One of their most visible and unusual traits is that fifth toe. The fifth toe. And they come in some very pretty color varieties. This historically important breed is currently found in the threatened category of the Livestock Conservancy's conservation they priority need list. some help. Mm-hmm. Now, historians have mapped out the Dorking's probable origin. They've gone over and over and over this. Because there are written sources. So it's a pretty safe assumption that the Dorking arrived in the UK with the Romans in 43 AD. That's a long time ago. And they matched description of five-toed chickens that were present in Italy during the first century. So nice. they're probably there before the first century. But where they came from before that is a mystery. I mean, that's a long time ago to be mapping since before 43 right? AD, man. Exactly. Well, we know chickens and people have been coexisting for 10,000 years, yeah. so this is just a small blip on the, right. the chicken timeline. There was trading throughout the Mediterranean region, both before and after, you know, both BC and AD. And this was amongst the Italians, the Middle East, Africa, the Far East. You had a lot of trade influences there. There were definitely trade routes open to move chickens to different regions. Yep. The Livestock Conservancy has an interesting theory. They mention the Ardennes chickens, which are a very old Belgian breed that also have a fifth toe. I think we've done a breed spotlight for them. No, I don't think we have. Wait, we haven't? I don't think so. Maybe it's coming up. I put it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that could possibly be a contender for a dorking relative, but there's such a strong correlation with written evidence that it is pretty likely right. that they were, who knows how long they had been with the Italians, the Romans, but they came to Britain from the Rome. They love those Italians. Mm-hmm. There is some very early written evidence that suggests that prior to the Roman invasion, the Britons did not eat their fowl. 
I think we talked about that before. I think so. Or maybe yeah. it was a Patreon episode. Maybe. They may have been kept as religious beings, like as a as a holy animal. They may have been kept simply as egg layers and as pets and companions. Chickens, we talked about this on Patreon, which if you haven't joined it, we have an extra episode every month that we put out. And I think we've talked about chickens and mythology over there yeah. and how especially the Romans, the Italians mm -hmm. and their superstitions had put the chickens in this role of gods or goddesses. Well, the Romans, the Britons did. Yeah. The Romans didn't. The Romans ate their chickens. But here's the thing. The Romans did this thing where they would say they're going to predict a battle. Right. That we talked about this. And they'd put out a big pile of corn. Yes. And they'd let the cockerels loose. Exactly. And if the cockerels ate the corn, the battle was on. Which you how know they're many, going to. Right. How many times? Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> so anyway, the Britons. So the Britons were not eating their fowl. The Romans seem to have shown up with their dual-purpose fifth toe birds and... Well, over time, they left the Britons with a taste for chicken. Oh, man. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Julius Caesar. <laughs> Those Italians. You know what happened to you. <laughs> we do know that the name Dorking comes from their time in the UK. So Dorking is a town in Surrey in the south of England. I think once upon a time it was Dorking. Yeah. But over time it morphed into Dorking. 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 And we know here in the US, if you call somebody a Dorking. They're going to get upset. Well, they're going to be like, why are you calling me a dorking? You call me a dork? Why a dorking? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it does it, but it, listen too quickly. You're it talking sounds to me? like, listen too quickly. It sounds like dork. Ging. <laughs> <laughs> so the dorking as we know them today were developed in this area in the south of England. Lewis Wright notes. Of course. Okay. <laughs> what is your deal? <laughs> What is wrong with him? Not that he writes a lot, man. He has something to say about all these chickens. He does. A what, lot. What, what would I rely on if it weren't for Lewis? <laughs> Lewis. I mean, it should. Lewis is like our third member. <laughs> I'm totally befuddled. What is your problem with him? <laughs> I don't have a problem with them. It's just that he had something to say about everything. Well, and if you're a historian, that's a good thing. <laughs> you don't want these silent types or these fools who didn't write anything. He was a thinker. He was a thinker. <laughs> and a writer. Yes. So he notes that at one point early on, the Dorkin cockerels were known to have double spurs. So oh, not God. only did they have five toes, they had double spurs. That's not a good combo. It's interesting. But this characteristic was largely bred out of them by the early 20th century. I was trying to picture this. Fifth toe sticking up. Double spurs. Spur coming at you. Out. Yeah. He would add a double hole in his shoe. If you had a dorky coming at him. Oh, yeah. That's right. Ricardo Montalban, spear, <laughs> uh, he spurred Pete through a sneaker. That's right. <laughs> so Lewis Wright also mentions the red dorking, specifically writes about that one because they're one of the oldest color varieties and because they were rarely found outside of their home in southern England. Right. He also theorizes, this was interesting to me, he theorizes that the white dorking may be the oldest and purest representative of the breed. Now, the white dorking has a large rose comb, and it's a little bit lighter in frame right. than some of the other dorkings that were bred and improved in England. I would have guessed that the rose comb was added in England. So many of the older ancient breeds have rose well, combs. the English ones, the red cap, the old yeah, English pheasant fowl. They all have the rose comb. And chickens from Italy generally have large straight combs. Right, right. So I feel like... I'm not sure I agree with Lewis on the white. Because wait, wait, you don't agree with Lewis. I don't agree with a lot of <laughs> stuff he says. I mean, he's a rich white man in the early 20th century. I just want to, I have to look up a picture of the man. Good luck finding one. I don't, I don't think I've ever found one. Really? Yeah, I don't think I've that ever found one. That might be my mission. I might have to find Do one. Do it. I'd love it if you could find one. Oh, yes. So anyway, I mean, doesn't it make more sense to you that a chicken that came from the Mediterranean has Would a have large a straight, straight comb? comb. Yeah. 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 They need it for heat regulation. Right. So we don't know exactly when the Dorking showed up in America, probably very early on. Now, wait. The Dorking was, when we took our chicken lady trip to Williamsburg, mm -hmm. they did have they a pair, pair of, of Dorkings mm -hmm. there, which yeah. were really beautiful. They're gorgeous chickens. I have to look sweet. back. I think we posted pictures and maybe repost some pictures mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. They were really nice. I'm not sure if Williamsburg has the chickens anymore. I don't know either. And that pair apparently were older and not fertile anymore. Oh. So, yeah, it's a shame. They, I love them for the moment I saw them. They were really cool chickens. Mm -hmm. The Dorking were, of course, in the first printing of the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in the English class. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's go through the colors that were accepted. Okay. So the white had the rose comb. And then there's a silver gray. And then there's the colored, which is a partridge kind of color pattern. Very pretty. Mm -hmm. They were the original varieties. Right. Now, in 1995, that red dorking was finally added. Wait, not until 1995? And then there's another one after that? No, seriously. 1995? Yeah. It took all that time from this ancient chicken to add the red into that. Maybe Lewis was right. And maybe they just didn't really move out of southern England. I don't know. I That's mean, crazy. Literally, if you crack open the most current standard of perfection, it's 1995 for the red dorking and then 1998 for, for the, the cuckoo. For the cuckoo, which they both have the single and the rose comb. Yeah. But... That's crazy to me. I know. Like, wrap your head around that. This chicken's been out since 43 AD, and it was just, these color varieties were just added in the 90s. I'm just guessing that that red didn't move far from England. That's the only thing I could think of. And this is an awesome bird, though. It's like the Dominique. People of all socioeconomic classes would have been keeping dorkings yeah. because of their incredible usefulness. Plus, they're really pretty. And the red ones, to me, are the prettiest. For I me. think the reds are beautiful. I really like the partridge colored ones, and I think the silver gray is gorgeous, too. So let's go into some other information about the Dorkings. They are a dual-purpose breed. They're a standard size chicken, and the roosters are pretty large. They're coming in at about 9 pounds and hens about 7 pounds. That's a larger size chicken. And here's the thing. They kind of look smaller than they are, like they're low, plump, round chickens. Yeah, and they're great. You know, I mean, you can grab them up in your arms, give them a big hug. They're very, um, very huggy. Yeah. And both the roos and the hens surprisingly have large straight combs. Yeah. So go back to that. So right. That, you know. Except those two varieties. The that have the, the rose combs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, they do have short legs, which Holly Ann was just talking about, which makes them low to the ground. It's not like Scott's dumpy low. It's I don't think they have that creeper gene. It's just that they have a shorter leg and they have a lot of fluff. So they're the not bottom. the little chicken. Right. Type, but they are shorter. Yeah, that creeper gene, I know. You were all about that creeper gene. <laughs> I know. So I think sometimes chickens who are lower to the ground have it a little bit better. First of all, the wind is less of an issue the lower you are to the ground. <laughs> just just hunch down. Hunch <laughs> you're, down there. You're not getting that high wind. And also <laughs> air quality. Right now, we're dealing with horrible air quality where we are in the Mid-Atlantic. <sighs> We're in like the danger zone or whatever because of the Canadian wildfires. Mm. We had a lot of questions regarding chickens and being out there. The one thing is chickens are very low to the ground. It so helps. the smog is l less likely to come all the way down. Right. I mean, I'm sure if you're in a really bad zone, particles can make their way to the ground. Right. But yeah, it's a horrible, worrisome situation. So they have white legs and red earlobes and red faces. <laughs> well, that's right. But... <laughs> Here's the thing. They have red earlobes, but guess what color eggs they lay? They do lay a cream or a white egg. Yeah. Yep. So I always like that. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit different, but, and they do come in the, the wide variety of colors. The silver gray is probably the most popular mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. Although I like the red. Okay. So they're pretty good layers. They do a medium large, like we said, a white, a cream chalky white egg, about 180 to 200. They're in that average. Respectable layer. Respectable mm -hmm. layer per year. And they will go broody. Yeah, so, they're supposed to be great mama hens. If you want a broody hen, this one might be for you. I mean, this is a breed that is good at a lot of things, and it really has something for everything. I would think they're gentle enough to be a good beginner's bird, but they have so many good attributes that... The experienced chicken keeper would want them too. I want them. I mean, this bird is like we said before, the worker bee breed that mm -hmm. was on every farm that kind of somehow got a little bit forgotten about when the industrialization came by. And, you know, the heritage breeds that were the main workers on the farm kind of mm -hmm. got pushed aside to yeah. the birds that were the big time layers. So, you know, they would be a great addition to your homestead. They would. I mean, I feel like they're the ultimate heritage breed. They're historically important and significant. Excellent homestead birds. They're excellent foragers. They are very popular show chickens. They are a popular breed that a lot of people show. They're really good family birds. Beautiful additions to a mixed flock. They're fancy enough for us chicken ladies and gents. Yep. They are one of the perfect breeds for regenerative agriculture or a permaculture system setup. 
And I mean, really, the only other thing we could say is there, there should be more of them around. Right. So, I mean, it's a good, sturdy farm, homestead, backyard bird for your flock. And they're gentle. Yeah. They have these wonderful, gentle, laid back personalities. Even that roo. Like we were petting that beautiful dorking hen at Williamsburg and the roo just hung out too. Oh, we were petting him too. Yeah. Yeah. The girls were petting him, taking pictures of him. Mm -hmm. They were a very common docile, that's for sure. They were. They were wonderful. So you've listened to the Breed Spotlight. And then your next logical question is... Where are you going to get them? (laughs) (laughs) Where are you going to get them? Where can I run and get this bird? So we're going to tell you where you can go. Well, if you are in the market for the silver gray dorkings, which really are beautiful... Murray McMurray Hatchery does have them. So the most popular breed, and that might be one of the reasons why they're the most popular, because it is... Availability. The availability Mm -hmm. of that color through McMurray Hatchery, and we just know that their birds are top quality. Absolutely. Look them up. If you haven't looked at McMurray's catalog, you know, jump online or crack open your catalog and look at these dorkings. They're very pretty. So Sandhill Preservation does sell the dorking in the color assortment, but we all know what happens with Sandhill Preservation, and it's in the name. Yeah. It's straight run. It's all about preserving right. the breed. So right. you're going to get straight run. You're going to, if you want to breed them, then that's great. Then go there. They might have the reds in that color assortment. I can't remember. Don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I've looked them up there, but I know they have them. A few, just a few other commercial hatcheries carry them. You can try the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory or the Dorking Breeders Group on Facebook to see if you can find some stock there. Yeah. This is a bird that more people should have. Oh, definitely. Now, if you're part of the crew that has them, we want to see pictures. DM us your pictures or put a picture in your story and then mention us and we will reshare that story for you or in our Instagram. We want to see your dorkings. Show them to us. They're beautiful. You know what I think? What's We're that? not going to see as many dorkings as we saw Brahmas. <laughs> yeah, we did see a lot. A lot of Brahmas. <laughs> okay, so show us your pictures. We want to see them. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Now let's move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 July. (laughs) Yep. It's summer and we couldn't let the summer go by without talking about Things that you really need to do in this time of the year for your chickens. Heat stress and how to help your chickens. I don't know which is worse. When you're in summer, summer's worse. When you're in winter, winter's worse. Chickens Mm -hmm. tend to deal with cold a little bit better. I'm not talking like freezing temperatures, but I'm talking about cold itself. In general, yeah. A little bit better than heat. I don't know which one scares me more. Maybe the heat. I don't know. They both scare me. I mean, I feel like I have more prep for winter. It's like something that I'm already geared up for. Mm -hmm. Of the two, and we'll talk about this a little bit, of the two, statistically speaking, the heat is worse. Yeah. The heat is worse on them, I believe. Yeah. I mean, we know already that parts of the South and the West have already been dealing with really terrible heat spells. Texas has been really bad. Mm Mm-hmm. So we're just going to share some of the best ways to prepare, to put some things in place to keep your chickens as comfortable as possible, and really to help decrease your stress and worry. Because, yeah, starting at about 80 degrees and upward can be enough to stress your birds. You just want them, when they're not acclimated to the heat, then it's going to cause a problem. This is how chickens work. Chickens get acclimated. We use that term a lot because chickens get used to things. So in the winter, when 
from the fall gradually gets colder and colder and colder and their bodies get used to it. In the summer, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. The heat tends to have more debilitating things happen to them quicker, I feel like. With winter, you have frostbite, you have all those other things, but in summer, they can stop breathing really easily. They can because hyperthermia is going to shut down systems. Yeah. But the heat can do a lot of weird things, which we'll talk about as we go on. I read a lot of studies Yeah, when we were preparing for this. So I, I guess we should start off by saying as much as you can keep a close eye on your flock because sometimes a chicken that seems absolutely fine can be overcome by the heat. It can cause her to collapse and die really quickly. Like rapid fire. Really quick. Really quick. So there have been several studies that have found that high temperatures can harm chickens in a variety of ways. They can cause them to lose electrolytes and become dehydrated. Both of these things can lead to dangerous pH changes in their bodies. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal, but if they become either too acidic or too alkaline, that can send them into a spiral that can lead to organ failure. Right. Exactly. Oh, just one more thing before we move on. This month for Patreon, actually for June, we did talk all about electrolytes and the importance of them, especially this time of the year. So if that's something that interests you, head over to Patreon and check it out. Yeah, we took a really deep dive. I learned a lot when when we were preparing for that. Because sometimes everyone says electrolytes, electrolytes, and you have to kind of understand what you need to know about them. why, right? Right. So we talk about that over on Patreon for our June episode being dehydrated, even for people, is something that sends you in quickly to a problem. Oh, dehydration is terrible. The heat can also cause oxidative stress in a chicken's body. And when that happens, it means there are too many free radical cells in their systems and there are not enough antioxidants present to get rid of them. That's not, I mean, like, sound like a good problem. We're at a molecular level there, right. but apparently it can really unleash a storm of issues. Exactly. Now, any chicken, whether they're Mediterranean breed, English breed, American breed, can succumb to a heat stroke or stress or whatever. But Mm -hmm. the larger chickens, the bigger body, the fluffy birds with all the feathers, and those with the small combs and waddles Mm. are going to be more likely to be affected by the heat. Right. So your bantams, your Mediterranean breeds, and the other big combs and waddles, they're going to do a little bit better. But they can also become victim to it. You know what? I'm going to backtrack us for a second because I just realized that we didn't talk that much about the dorking and the heat and the cold. And the dorking actually does quite well in a mid-Atlantic climate. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean... The big home and waddles help them dispel heat. Yeah. But they're also big and fluffy. Exactly. Back to what we were talking about. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So the first thing that we are going to mention is the most important thing that you can do for your chickens... And this is something that we've talked about all along through all of our episodes with planning your flock, planning their setup, planning their home, is they need shade. And lots of it. Whether you have a tree that's somewhat near that hangs over and gives them shade at a certain time of the day, or you purchase shade sales, which everyone knows what happened to me last July. A tree fell on my coop or on my run and destroyed it. Well, and that tree was your shade tree. That was my shade tree. So now in my runs, I have commercial shade sales because they need a shade. Right. So in my runs, we built up against the wood line. So they're in shade a lot of the time. And mine's up against the wood line too, but- well, there was more of a wood line before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the trees kind of keep falling. So if you say, look, I don't have trees on my property, that's okay. Right. Go right. to Amazon. I even think we have them on our storefront. Yeah, they're on our storefront. Mm-hmm. And purchase the shade sales that you tie like triangles- Yeah. And that can create shade in itself. It keeps them shady. It keeps the sun from beating down on them. It keeps the dirt cooler. Right. I was just going to say that the dirt under their coops, Mm -hmm. you're going to notice in the heat, they're going to take a lot more dust baths under that coop because the dirt, if you put your hand down in it- It's cooler. It's a lot cooler. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're going to see them digging under those coops because it's cooler in the ground. Right. Next on the list, just as important- Cool water. They need a constant supply of water in the shade for them to drink. If you go out there midday and the shade and the water's in the sun in the summertime, it's going to feel like hot. Especially if it's in a metal dish. And you're going to put your hand in it. Or a plastic too. Actually, plastic holds a surprising amount of heat. Yeah. And it's not going to be refreshing. So you may need to change up the water midday in the summer. You can change it. You You can add ice to it. Right. You can float frozen icy things in it. 
water bottles, the water bottles that you use, it's a good way to recycle them, refill them with water, put them in the freezer, and then put them in your water bowls. If you have a chicken that you suspect is laboring in the heat, you can actually, you want a shallow pan for this. You can put them in a shallow pan of cool water and getting their feet cooled off will really help them cool down a lot. Feet only. Right. Do not dunk your bird. No. Do not get your whole bird wet. This is essentially steams them. This is something I did first year on was buy baby pools, the little tiny baby pools. Mm -hmm. And I just put like two gallons of water in the bottom. Yeah, so it's shallow. Mm -hmm. And during the day, we would come out. We had two things. We had a a spray bottle, like a tanning spray bottle Mm -hmm. with with cold water. And we had the two gallons that we would switch off midday. And we would just dunk their feet in the water. Yeah. You can just pick them up and place them in the water. And then they'll walk out and it'll kind of cool them down a little bit. And yeah, it's okay if you get feathers on a feather-legged chicken wet. It's okay on the on like their legs. It. Yeah. <laughs> we were just talking about this, the electrolytes. With electrolytes, there are several excellent commercial products on the market. And some of them are very low cost. And they're good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You can also DIY electrolytes. There are a couple of recipes. But, you know, you can pick up those little packets of electrolytes for a couple of dollars. You don't have to go overboard with this. My favorite product is Strong Animal Chicken Essentials Flock Fixer. Yep. Mine too. That has everything you need in for extreme weather. Mm-hmm. One way or the other, it's always good to have a bag of it. You don't need it every day. You need it on those super hot days. And you have to, like Holly Ann said, follow the instructions because on every electrolyte, it's a different instruction because they're formulated all a little differently. Right. You have to look for your individual manufacturer and see how they say if it's once every other day, if it's three days on, three days off, that's what you should do. And believe us, they are different. And electrolytes can save your birds, but they can also be harmful if they're used at too strong a dose or they're used for too long. Right. Also, please don't withhold your bird's feed when it's hot. No. They always need feed. And here's the thing that you can do if you're concerned. You can take cold water Mm -hmm. and add it to the feed. Right. And it'll be a colder treat for them and make a mash. And gets a little more liquid in their body. It gets them more hydrated that way. So making a cold mash in the morning for them is good. Now, there are some different things that are naturally high in the electrolytes Mm -hmm. and balanced to what people need and chickens. So melons. Yeah. The number one melon is watermelon. It's very high in electrolytes. Surprisingly high in electrolytes. Yes. Yeah. So and we know watermelon is one of the chicken's most favorite snacks. If you give them those on a hot day, cut them up, that's going to naturally help that electrolyte to be balanced. Those electrolytes. Cantaloupe is also an excellent any melon really. Cantaloupe is also excellent. It doesn't have quite as many electrolytes as watermelon does. Also a great choice though. And when you're going to do snacks, you don't want to be giving scratch or heavy carbohydrates at this point. Switch to giving them some greens, some finely chopped grapes or apples to help them with moisture and some sugar. And those you can put in the fridge or in the freezer and flash freeze. You don't want them solid like a rock, but just for a little while because then it's another way to get some coldness into their bodies and start to cool them down. So you're going to work from internal that way. Now, external, the next big thing. And this is a controversy too, and I don't know why. Good Lord, I don't either. Fans. Fans. Fans in your coop. Fans in your run if you want. Fans Fans everywhere. everywhere. (laughs) Because air circulating will help cool the coop and it will pull hot air away from the chickens. Chickens don't sweat. Nope. They don't have sweat glands, but that doesn't mean that fans are useless. They're not. (laughs) So the only place that heat comes out of the chickens are the combs, the waddles, and their feet. Uh, Under their wings, too. Yes. They're kind of like dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. They pant out most of the heat through respiration. Now, here's the thing, though. Without fans in your coops, they can become complete hot boxes. Oh, yes. Like, you know, there are times we go out to put the chickens away here in Maryland, and we're the top of the south. Right. So, you know, everyone south of us, it's even worse. We'll go out to put the chickens in, and it's 80 Fahrenheit. Yeah. So, the fans are very, very necessary. You know what I I was just thinking? (laughs) You know how like on the Amish coops, they have the little actual like the the house window? Yeah. Wouldn't it be awesome if someone out there made a little window Window air air conditioner? conditioner. (laughs) You know, flower farmers have a little teeny window air conditioner. Wouldn't that be amazing? 
I don't. Well, here's the problem with it, though. They wouldn't be acclimated That's coming back problem. out. But I mean, if you could just set it to be like, 70 degrees if versus. If it was a big enough coop, like you guys, are staying, you guys are staying in the AC for the next 10 days. <laughs> Not coming out. Can you imagine seeing a little coop with like the window air conditioner on the side? Oh my god! I can't tell you how many times I've wished for barn air conditioners or coop air conditioners. The neighbors oh, yeah. would be like, "Oh my god, they're so bougie." <laughs> <laughs> I think I surpassed bougie. <laughs> I would do it though. I would set it at you know little thermostat in there. Yes. Well, oh. even more than the wooden coops. I mean, the plastic coops because they're so well insulated. Yeah. Either or. Yeah. I mean, they have the little window that looks just like a house window. So Several you, little windows, you yeah. You could take that screen out and you put could. a little box air conditioner in there. But mine have hardware cloth over the screens. Mine don't, and that's the problem. I need to put some over it so I can open it in the summer. Uh, okay. I close it at night and yeah. put the fans on. Okay. And I have a big, long window that does have hardware yeah, the cloth back. Right, that right. stays open. But it gives you a cross breeze if you can get those. I know. Yeah, Pete and I did that first thing when we got the coops. We just put the hardware cloth I right on I think I them. may see if Joe can do that in those 20 hours of chicken labor he owes That's me for right. Mother's Day. All you need to do is clip a square, and we just used U-nails and hammered them in. Or you could use a staple gun. You could, but the U-nails are more stable. Oh, Okay. But if you have a heavy-duty staple gun, it should be good enough. Yeah. Unless you're going to have a bear or a giant raccoon hanging on the front of your coop, it should be fine. The schools in our neighborhood, though, a few weeks ago were shut down because there was a black bear on the property. They're coming down. Yeah. We're, it's we're having not a lot good. Of, yeah, we're having a lot of bears around here. I don't like hearing that. Well, they're coming down because of the wildfires up north, so they're all moving down. And Ella was like, we were out, and they were like, everyone in, there's a black bear. And she was like, where? I want to see it. Well, the, I mean, and it's not the end of the world unless they have cubs, and then you just want to be far away. Yeah. Exactly. So okay. anyway, ice pack. So plastic coops. We talked about this before. Plastic coops. You can put an ice pack in your plastic coop. It acts as a cooler. It does. It will bring the temperature down substantially. We are also fans of the. <laughs> we're fans of the small window fans. <laughs> we're fans. The ones with the rechargeable batteries. You can fasten one right in the window and just pull the air straight through the coop. Right. You might need bigger fans in a bigger coop. You might need multiple fans in a bigger coop to keep the air moving. Right. And if you don't have electricity, that's where the rechargeable battery, mm -hmm. small ones, comes in handy right. because then you can just rotate your batteries. You can buy a set of rechargeable batteries yeah. yep. and rotate them, rotate them, rotate them, and keep your fans a-going. We use the rechargeable battery fans on all of our smaller coops. The two really big Amish coops have a fan in there from a company called Vornado. Yeah. They're not huge. They sit on the floor of the coop and they're pointed at the ceiling and boy, do they move air. They, I mean, yeah. they really move air. My chickens are, I think, pretty comfortable in there. So, fans. Next, there we go, ice. Ice. And, you know, we said bring the ice pack in. Mm -hmm. Put the ice in the water, frozen water bottles in the water. Yeah. The other thing you can do is take big gallon-sized water containers and freeze them. And then put them around so that they can lay up against them. Mine never do, but you can do it. Maybe you'll have someone who I does. I do it, and mine never lays up against yeah, no, it. No. But if you put it in the coop, it also acts to bring the temperature well, Right, down. because as water evaporates or condenses, it, yeah, yeah. It, it lowers the temperature around it. So, But it is an option. It is an option, And if you yeah. start when they're young, maybe you maybe, can train them to Maybe they'll go be used to it. We say as we, I mean, I have seven Asiatics who are getting ready to go out. So <laughs> yes, getting them used to it is a good idea. So ice, other things, neutralize bullying. Yeah. No bullying. Put off any non-essential health care or maintenance that you don't need to do when it's hot. Because they're already stressed. Exactly. You know? And don't let kids, if you have kids who love to chase the chickens, now's not the time for it. No. Don't let dogs chase or bother the chickens. They need to be as unstressed as possible. Yeah. And here's the thing. If you notice that somebody is showing signs of open mouth breathing, not moving around as much, mm. not comb, eating or drinking. Comb and waddles are getting pale. Then that's the time it's okay to bring your chicken into the AC. But, that might be the one thing that helps save them. Exactly right. But then you need to keep them there until temperatures have gone down. Right. You often hear that myth that chickens will die if you have a coop heater and the power goes out, your chickens are going to die. No. No. But the opposite is true. So there are a lot of studies that have found that a cool chicken going suddenly into extreme heat cannot acclimate. It's heat stress. It's the same way for people. Right. And they, and they actually can die from the effects of the high temperatures. Like they can't breathe right. Right. You know, organs aren't working. So 
Just remember, if you have to bring one in, no big deal, but just keep her there until the hot spell has broken. And this is why I like, okay, so we have put some reels up of me with the stroller. I have a pet stroller <laughs> <laughs> that I take the chickens on walks. I take them to breweries. I take them other places. But the stroller also acts as this. If you need to bring one in the house, say for heat stroke, you can put them in there without shavings, without anything else, right. just some blankets, yep. and it gives you another place to keep them. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a portable pop-up almost. Exactly. So if you have any questions, you have any concerns, you want to ask us anything, DM us or email us, and we will answer you the best that we can. So let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, we're going with something old-fashioned this week. Old-fashioned vanilla custard. Yeah, we like summer desserts. Mm -hmm. That's that's a time for them. This is an old-time custard that is cooked on the stovetop, and then you pour it into little custard cups or bowls, right? which we both had growing up. I still do. Yeah, I know. I love that you have yours. Ours are long gone. (laughs) Then you refrigerate them and you serve them chilled. Great make-ahead dessert for a party. And And custard's very rich, and it gives you a little different taste Mm -hmm. than, say, ice cream or something like that. So let's go over the ingredients. You're going to need four cups of whole milk or oat milk, a tablespoon of vanilla paste or vanilla extract, and it's depending upon how rich that vanilla you want. The paste is going to be richer. Mm -hmm. A tablespoon of butter or dairy-free butter, four eggs, two-thirds cup of sugar, and three tablespoons of cornstarch. You're going to start off by whisking together the eggs, the sugar, and the cornstarch. You're going to whisk those together until the sugar has dissolved and the cornstarch is absorbed. Set that aside. Plop a medium saucepan over medium heat. You're going to add your milk, your vanilla, and your butter. Stir that together as it melts. You're going to bring it to a simmer and pull it off the heat. Now you're going to temper that egg mixture. Again, we talk about it. Right. Tempering eggs is a culinary skill you want to master. So you're going to start adding two spoonfuls of that hot mixture to the egg mixture. Whisk the whole time. Continue adding and whisking until at least half of the egg mixture has been added. Then you're going to pour everything back into the pan, return it to low heat, and keep whisking continuously. You do want to keep the heat low. You want it at a simmer at the most. You definitely don't want to let it boil. That'll cook the eggs too fast, and then you get nasty lumps. Exactly. So you're just going to cook stirring on low for another 10 minutes or so until the custard has thickened enough to coat the back of a spoon. Take it off the heat, pour it into your custard cups or bowls, bonus points if they're vintage. Yep. You're going to refrigerate it for several hours, or overnight is easiest, really, if you can do that. And then before serving, you sprinkle it with the magic. Sprinkles? (laughs) Well, you could put sprinkles on it, couldn't you? Yeah. You could. So, yeah, you could put nutmeg, cinnamon... Uh, nutmeg, is, nutmeg is the classic for custard. It's the classic, but whatever your taste buds want. I mean, yeah, if you want sprinkles, have at it. <laughs> sprinkles all the way. Yeah, so it's yummy. Try it. You might like it. It's a great dessert for summertime. So easy, not hard at all. It's pretty and it's delicious. You can like really wow people and it's so easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're going back in time, man. Back, back, back. To our childhood. Avon Chicken <laughs> Collectibles. Who yes, out we said there Avon. Was an Avon lady or is an Avon lady? Or who out there remembers being younger and your mom going through the Avon catalog with you? Well, the and, Avon lady would come to the door. Yeah, and saying, what do you want? There's two things I always wanted. What? I always wanted those... The set of the mini lipsticks. They were only oh, like- Oh, those were cute, yeah. Those mini lipsticks. Mm-hmm. And then any perfume bottle that looked like an animal. Yeah. They always had those. Well, funny you should mention that. <laughs> I, I will say, before we get to that, I will say, and I'm still on the hunt for it, there's a lamb. I think I've seen it. The lamb perfume bottle? Yes. Well, why didn't you buy that for me? I might have it at my mom's house somewhere. What? Maybe. Oh. <laughs> anyway, okay. So the Avon Company has been around for a long time. They were founded in 1886 in New York to sell door-to-door perfume. Like I said, I love those animal perfume bottles or like any kind of shaped. They were originally called the California Perfume Company, and they changed the name to Avon in 1928. A whole bunch of reasons behind all that, which we're not going to go into. Here's what we are going to tell you. The founder hired a woman to drive her buggy 
horse and buggy, door to door to sell the perfumes. And she was so incredibly successful that he began building a female sales team and he called them Avon ladies. The Avon ladies. And if you re- they recall that forever. Yeah. I do have memories of growing up and sitting there with that catalog and picking out what I wanted. I and loved for when it. the lady came back and you would give her the order right. and then she would deliver it. Yep. It was great. So yeah, like I said, I did receive a catalog not too long ago in my driveway. Awesome. In a bag. I'm kind of jealous. It's still here. We have to look at it. Yeah. And I went out and I was almost jumping up and down. I'm like, this is great. Avon catalog. When we were in high school and I had just started college, I worked at several auto parts. Remember oh, that? Yes, you several did. Several auto parts for You seven talked years. to me for a long time every time you worked there too. On the phone. I was on the phone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. Anyway, it's because they were walking distance of mine. Yeah. And I learned a ton about dealing with people there. Anyway, there was an Avon lady in the neighborhood that would bring me a catalog when I worked there. Yeah. Avon's the best. Love it. So before too long, Avon started selling cosmetics and other things in addition to the perfumes. Lots of things. In the 1970s, they added jewelry and household and kitchen stuff. Some of it was poultry themed. All of it is very collectible. Highly collectible. Now. You can get lucky. I have gotten lucky and found some stuff in thrift stores. Well, I'm going to, this next thing I'm going to mention, I know you have found. So in the 1970s, early in the 1970s, there was, I'm not sure if she's glass or ceramic. There was a hen on the nest that came with mini soaps inside. And I have her. You have her. And we found her together on a thrift store shopping binge when we went out one day. At a very, very good price. I have found her on Etsy and eBay too. So you can find her. And every now and again, someone will have the soap still in there. I don't know if you want to use it. Mine did not have the soaps. That's okay. And I paid $5. Yeah. I was so happy. I'll put her on our socials. Yeah, yeah. She's really cute. In the 1980s, there was a milk glass duck on a nest candy dish. I have that one. Also from a thrift shop. There is a set of absolutely fantastic ceramic rooster canisters. Nice. There are chick coffee mugs that are very 1980s as well. And then some other items. Some of these are really rare and hard to find. Others, you can find them in the wild, but you can also find them on eBay and Etsy. Yeah. So other items. There's a hen lotion bottle. Oh, wow. There is a rooster perfume bottle. Is it brown? I have to look no, that up. No, he's white like a lamp. Okay. Boy. There's a terracotta rooster diffuser, a light up glass chick, a rare set of terracotta chicken votive holders, a chicken shaped wicker basket, soup mugs, and a very rare, they're very rare sets of cream and sugar bowls with chickens painted on the sides. I only found one of them. Okay. So do you have any of this stuff? If you do, do a story on Instagram and mention us so that we can reshare you because we have such good childhood memories of Avon. And well, they have some other stuff that, you know, came out in the 80s that I collect. I've got these beautiful glass tumblers with geraniums on them. Oh, yeah. I think we found them the same time we found your little head on a nest. Yeah. Probably somebody had Avon at somebody's house mm-hmm. and they got rid of it. I mean, I like I said, those little mini lipsticks that you could buy 12 in a set. I, I remember a, my mom buying them and me going in and putting them on. I had a little sparkly lipstick pot yeah. that you put on with your finger. You know that cameo that I gave you for your birthday is Avon. I know. Yeah. In the box. In the original box. Yep. Yes. Yep. So. Okay. So if you have Avon, share your pictures. Yeah. Now, should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Oh, yes. Next week, we are profiling a super chicken, an uber chicken. <laughs> the Barnavelder. The Barnavelder. Main topic, we're talking about crop impaction, surgery, and aftercare. Yes. It's important. Mm-hmm. Ooh, cracking the eggs. We're doing peach custard pie. We're loving these desserts. Yeah. And retail therapy, we are talking crop bras, both ones you can purchase and some DIY. Yeah, because you're going to need to know these. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.